Welcome back to Speakeasy. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, and I have a new guest with me today. You will know this gentleman from his role as Tom Haverford on Parks and Recreation. You will also know him as a stand-up comedian in his own right. You can't take that away from him. Please say hello to Aziz Ansari. Aziz, hello. Thank you for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Oh, no. Look, uh, that's proof that we're not poisoning each other. Cool. <laughs> How's it's everything? pretty cool. Yeah. Everything's good. How are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for making the time. You're a busy guy. It's a miracle we were able to capture you for a few moments. Mm -hmm. You did not make it easy. We literally had to capture you. I have a lot of responsibilities. That's right. I got parks, stand up, I manage a Whole Foods on La Brea, <laughs> and fit in interviews. Now that Whole Foods, they got the community bulletin board. Mm -hmm. um, I've put some of my complaints up there and they have not been addressed. To this day. What are, what are the complaints? I'll address them right now. Um, I feel like some of the organic carrots are not as yummy as they could be. Mm, 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 mm. Which, which Whole Foods are you going to? Uh, the one... Oh, not the one on the bright. That's a different That's department. not your jurisdiction. Guy. I do apologize. Come on down to my spot. Get the carrots there. Let me know what you think. That's right. Oh, oh you'll hear about it. Believe you me. Bib lettuce. Also <laughs> fantastic right now. Bib lettuce. Bib lettuce is the one that's kind of, it's like softer, floppier lettuce, It's like right? a, a leafy thing. You ever go to um, Mofuku Sambar in New York? Yes, absolutely. Have you ever had, they do this thing called the Bosam, it's like this huge like pork butt. Yes. And then you make like little wraps with bib lettuce. Yes. And I, and I made that at home, so I bought bib lettuce for that. There we, how good. did it turn out at home? It was great, it was so good, I just started cooking. It's actually really easy, you just like buy this big, not cooking, which, which it kind of is actually. Because you just like, if it's a recipe, a recipe that's not like, Difficult is just following instructions. There's usually nothing like technically very hard. It's just right. like do what it says. Like the pork butt, all you do is you buy this huge pork butt. You just go to like a good meat market, and then you put like sugar and something on it, marinate it overnight, and then you put it in the oven for like six hours, and it slow cooks. Oh man, so six good. hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to it's a you got to check in on every hour. But uh, this is like a recipe that involves a calendar. I mean, you gotta have time. You yeah. gotta you gotta have a not lot <laughs> not a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, I had a day off. I was like. I make this pork butt. But now you've been, I know that you're you're a big foodie. Yes. You like you, I do like you love restaurants, you love going out, you love yeah. trying new places and everything. Yeah, yeah. But but so getting into making your own food is is a relatively recent thing for you? I, I spend a lot of time in New York mm -hmm. and uh, so I miss like some of the food I eat in New York, like uh, in particular I like uh, the cheeseburger at Shake Shack. Have you ever had that? I never have, but I've heard about it. It's, it's legendary. fantastic. Yeah. So I started um, trying to experiment, trying to make my own Shake Shack so I could have it in LA. And then I just started making other things. Then I moved to a, a different place in LA with a bigger kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that just kind of, uh, it all kind of came together. Now, now I'm pretty into it. So, like time-wise, how long has it been since you started making your own? Mm, sort of making a couple your own of months. <laughs> and you know, like when you tour, like do you have certain like places that you love to eat at when you're in? Oh yeah, cities? absolutely, yeah. So like, yeah, like there's a place in Vancouver that I had like these this amazing lamb dish, and I'm always like, oh man, I wish I could have that dish. It was so good. And it's like, oh, I can just make it at home. The recipe's online. It's not that hard. You were like Prometheus stealing fire yeah, from the it, gods. It was really quite a revelation. <laughs> that I can just do this myself. I don't need these people. So now. You You've not, you've not been to a restaurant since. I've, I, I've only been eating at home you all the time. <laughs> I've cut out the middleman. <laughs> Straight to me. Now you you lived in New York for how many years? Eight years. Okay. And then I came to LA, but I still kind of go back a lot. Um, yeah, I mean I, I like New York a lot. I, I do more stand up in New York. I just feel like it's it's more conducive to when I'm like writing stand up. Yeah. You know, trying to write new stuff, I can just do a lot more spots. Because you can go up a lot more places. Yeah. yeah. But you, you're from Columbia, South Carolina. Grew up in South Carolina, yeah. and then I went to college in New York for four years, and that's when I started doing stand-up, and then um, after I graduated, I just stayed there for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then after, the four years after college is when I kind of started doing more acting stuff, and I had to come out to LA. <laughs> that's what everyone who moves here from New York says, that they had to come here. Yeah, <laughs> <You're> forced. <laughs> do you still, in your in your heart, let's say, do you still identify as a Southerner? In certain aspects, not mm -hmm. in the, uh, homophobic, racist ways, but more in oh, like... Oh, well, that's what I meant, so... <laughs> more in like the, I like biscuits and uh, cream, <laughs> cream corn a lot. <laughs> but I also really identify with New York, you know, I've, I lived in New York, I mean, I'm kind of almost like 10 years probably total, if yeah. you include all the times I've bought back for... Uh, I include it, split. I include it. Yeah, you yeah. can factor that in, so that's, you know, about a third of my life has mm -hmm. been in New York. Do you still have a... A, a grudging uh, attitude towards Los Angeles, or do you like it? No, no, I like Los it's Angeles fine, too. It's fine, right? Yeah. Come on. I think a lot of people, when they first move here, they try to make LA and New York, mm -hmm. and you can't do that. You've yeah. got to like enjoy the things about LA. 
you know, whether it's, you know, oh, I can go to the beach or I can swim in someone's pool yeah. or eat tacos or whatever. Be a citizen of the world. Yeah, you yeah. have to you have to embrace what makes LA. LA. Yeah. You can't be like, oh, everything's closing it too. Well, that's the way it is here. Stop <laughs> complaining. It's not going to change. Look at all the space you live in. <laughs> yeah, you have so much Trade off. Do something in your house yes. till four in the morning. You have so much room. Run around. <laughs> Don't just complain. <laughs> Now being a regular on a network TV show, is that like a thing that you always saw yourself doing or was no, that just... No, I mean, when I started doing stand-up, I never thought about it like, oh, uh, this is something I'll get to, you know, tour and do theaters or anything. I just wanted to get really good at stand-up. <laughs> and I, I remember I'd like, uh, even like doing open mics, like, do you remember there would always be like, I think there would always be like a couple of guys that were like really on top of like headshots and stuff. Oh, and yeah. Like, oh, I'm thinking about meeting with this manager. It's like... You've been doing stand-up for like three months and you're horrible. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. Like, why do you not care about like getting good at this? Yeah. And that's all I ever really cared about. And, and that's all you, you, you really do as a stand-up is like, you're just, you're just trying to write new bits that you're really excited about that work. If you do that well, I think everything else just kind of falls into place. And for me, like, you know, acting wasn't something I'd really planned, but I, I made some uh, short films with the, with the Human Giant guys. We did yeah. those sketches and that was fun. And then we got the sketch show. And then that kind of led to the opportunity to do other acting, which which I enjoy. I enjoy acting, but stand up is like the kind of uh, engine that drives everything I, I get to do. Speaking of Human Giant, were you doing those videos on your own first? Like the videos where you would be out and about in New York and and just kind of messing with people in a, in a very gentle way. It was never like trying yeah. to unnerve people. I mean, we only did one thing like that. The, the other things. Was it the boombox thing? The boombox okay. thing, yeah. Uh, we did that, and then there was this thing called Shutterbugs, where me and Rob Hubel play a child talent agent. So right. we made that on our own. And then there was a thing where me and Paul Shear played these like kind of Chris Angel style magicians called Illusionators, mm -hmm. and we made that on our own. And it was kind of those three things that MTV saw, and they were like, "Hey, would you guys want to make a sketch show where you're doing this kind of stuff?" So with your stand-up. Is it fair to say your style has started to evolve? Totally. Um, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Which is a common thing. You start out, and it's and it's very jokey, and and there's definitely a distance there. But you've I've noticed you've started to get more personal with yeah, your stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Was that a scary thing at first to kind of open up in that way? No, I, I find it like weirdly kind of cathartic because it's mm -hmm. interesting because like I've been touring this material for a while, and uh, I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm I'm about to be ready to record it and put it out as a special. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been writing some new stuff about like what's going on in my head right now. And it's just more fun to perform that stuff because that's what you're like kind of in right now. Yeah. To me, it's most fun when you do a joke and people laugh, but you also get that sense that they're like, oh, thank you for saying that. I, I felt that at some point and, yeah. and you know, it just kind of feels like, oh, good. You know, if you're doing a sort of um, observational sort of thing, that people have the, the laughter of recognition, yeah. that they've had that experience or whatever. But when you're talking about more personal stuff and uh, and people respond to it, there is a deeper connectivity there. Absolutely, that is yeah. very rewarding. Yeah, much more rewarding to me than like, oh, if I made some observation about like shampoo, if everyone's like, oh yeah, I know that. That to me is like not that rewarding. But if you're talking about like, oh, I'm dealing with this situation with this girl I really like that blew me off or something and people are like, oh, I hate when this particular thing happens, yeah. yes. Then it's like you really, you feel like a deeper thing. And you can tell when it's happening. It's, yeah, it's you a can different, totally. It's a different vibe. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you can even see people sometimes like, like yeah, 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 you know? <laughs> now this is not to discount Aziz's classic shampoo bit. The shampoo bit is still available on CD and yes, digital form. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is it tough sometimes to get off the road and get back into the day-to-day -day of parks and recreation? It is, but I do like having that balance. It's kind of nice. Um, I mean, it's kind of like going back between New York and LA. It's kind of nice to have both. Um, so yeah, I like parks. Park and parks is a pretty. It's the nicest, sweetest gig I could ever ask for. I mean, I love all the people I get to work with, right. and because it's like a, such an ensemble show. Usually the work week isn't that bad, so I can still do stand up in LA and stuff, and it's not a, not a huge deal. I'm not right. there like all the time, every day. I mean, I'm here right now. I'm not there. Oh my so. god, that's true. So is this gonna point. be a problem? <laughs> is Amy Poehler gonna bust through that door? <laughs> Were you a lifelong hip hop fan? I, the first time I really remember listening to hip hop was probably in the '90s when um, gangster rap was really getting big, like you know Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and stuff. Like, I just remember it had like such a tremendous crossover mainly because of MTV and and I've read now like that was like a big deal like uh, that guy uh, Jimmy Iovine or whatever yeah uh, he went to MTV and was like look don't just play rap music 
during like the rap show. Play it all the time. Kids right. will love it. Like put it on after like Guns N' Roses or whatever. People will be into it. Mm -hmm. And obviously it worked. And that's how I remember watching MTV. I remember like every day, like before I would go to school, I'd watch MTV and I remember, you know, th those those Dre and Snoop videos were just massive. And, yeah. uh, you know, and then Wu-Tang Clan a little bit too. Um, Did it strike a chord in you the first time you saw it? Were you like, I mean, those new songs world. are so undeniably right. good. I mean, yeah. I had nothing to relate to it. I was like a third grade <laughs> kid in right. this tiny redneck town in South Carolina, but right. that's how tremendous like MTV was. And like, oh, you can get something from fucking Compton right. to Bennettsville, South Carolina, where it's right. resonating with like redneck kids whose mm. somewhat distant relatives are probably very racist. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but that was like when I was first listening to hip hop. But, you know, I listen to a lot of uh, uh, rock music and stuff too. I mean, yeah. I think because I've done some random things involving hip hop, people right. just assume that's kind of all I listen to. But I listen to a lot well, of Well, but it's also, stuff. yeah, it's, it's because it's, it's, you know, you there you are doing a cameo in this video with, uh, with Jay-Z and Kanye, but you're also like kind of friends with these guys, you know? Like you're yeah, hanging yeah. out with them. So yeah. it is like um, that, that, uh, association seems it does seem more uh, it, it seems rather personal you know yeah that um, like uh, it's fair to say Kanye West is, is a buddy of yours right <laughs> yeah I mean I'm buddies with some like indie rock people too I, <laughs> right? no 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 I'm I not mean, trying to put no, you in no, a no. box or anything yeah. but I feel like there's like a, uh, a kinship between people that do comedy and music like, yeah absolutely. I feel like music people are big comedy fans yeah. and especially when like you're touring and stuff that's something to kind of bond on I think people yes I think people can understand the creativity uh, between the two things mm -hmm. I think there's a there's a kinship there and also it is the is the life is very similar yeah you know of having to travel around and writing you know, new material all that stuff and, yeah. and it is just different enough where it's kind of interesting to peek into the other side you yeah. know when you see musicians working on an album or you know, I have musician friends that have come watch me like write new material and stuff, and yeah. uh, not right, not sitting in my house writing, but like do, doing yeah, sets. You know, exactly. <laughs> come over to my house and look at me <laughs> scribbling a moleskin. <laughs> do you sit and write like that, or do you just kind of write on stage mostly when you're writing stuff? It's mostly on stage. It's like I have an idea of the thing that I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, like bullet then, points. Yes, exactly. That's the same for me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then you kind of get the wording figured out yeah. on stage. Yeah. But I think that most people, uh, most comedians I ask that to, it's that I. I don't know anybody that like sits down and is like, let me write my jokes. Yes, yeah. I think it's if you're doing just jokes, but I I, uh, I think you you do kind of have to do that. But if your style is more as as comedic trends have changed and things have gotten more conversational, yeah, it's just you can't fake that, you know. Yes. So yeah, you're right. I bet like you know one liner guys that do one liners they probably are able to. They like, still gonna someone sit like there. Anthony Justin they could probably sit yeah. down and he has to be very precise and probably yeah. writes his stuff down. But like our stuff is more. Conversational, and you're right. You yeah. couldn't really fake it. He he made his choice as he's. Yeah, All and right. it's an uh, and it's an inferior way of doing comedy. Yeah, but he made anyways, a mistake. Um, <laughs> made a mistake, Anthony. Yeah, you'll never no, see. No, he's it. so funny. <laughs> but when you're just kind of writing on stage, like you kind of find those nuggets that you didn't think was gonna be an interesting aspect to what you're talking about, and you can just kind of go into different tangents and oh, stuff. Oh yeah, but it's nice to to have people that are interested enough in hearing what you have to say that they will give you the the time to find, well there's a trust there that's like, I know that you're getting to something. Yeah. Because you know? yeah. there's a lot of, there's a period where you're trying out new stuff where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stammering. There's a lot of like, you know, trying to come up with, the, like. There's a lot of fat that you eventually yeah. have to trim. Yeah, yeah. Because you're trying to come up with a funny thing to say, you know, every two seconds because it feels like an eternity when you're up there and it's like, ah, oh, I've just been setting this up for like minutes and minutes and minutes. Usually there's some nugget, like in, when you have that bullet point, it's like, oh, I know there's something really funny about this. Yeah. And then it's just like figuring out how to convey like why that notion or concept is funny. And sometimes you kind of have to stammer around and then you find it. And then the next time you do it, it's like, okay, well that was the, the way to kind of get to that point quickly. And then that's, that's a version of that point that really hit home. Do you record yeah. yourself? I record every set I do, yeah. Do you listen back to it? Usually, if it's something, I, I don't listen to it all the time. Um, right. I'll listen to it if there's some, if I'm working on stuff, obviously I'll listen to each set. Like, my process, like if I'm in New York, like I'll go to this club, the Comedy Cellar, like on a Friday or something and do like, drop in and do like three sets that night. Mm -hmm. So the first night, uh, first set, I'll, I'll do it and that'll be kind of like the most fatty, weird version of the jokes. And then I'll listen to that and say, okay, well that's what worked, then trim it down a little bit, then the second show, you know, and then the third show, you listen to the second one. And so by the time the weekend's over, you've done like 12 sets, and so whatever started there is, is pretty good if you if you kind of listen and refine. Do you record all yours or no? I do record, it's tough to listen to. 
Why? Because you feel weird just listening to yourself? Uh, yeah, I feel, well, there's that, and then it's also, like, it, it's annoying to have to sit through the stuff that's not working to get oh, to the yeah, stuff yeah, that's yeah. working, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, in my mind, I'm like, go, oh, come on, get yeah. to it. You are uh, a bit of a, and it's a known thing, you're a bit of a fashion plate. You enjoy clothing. I do, as do you. Uh, well, that's true. We've never really, uh, we've never really talked suits <laughs> that's and stuff. That's true. Yeah, but yeah. I'm a big admirer of, of, of your, well, your thank, suit game. Thank, and likewise, <laughs> yeah, because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of guys that really dress up much for God, comedy. In, in our field, there's not many guys that like really. It's give a shit really at all. true. There's like what, I mean, the biggest a dozen guy, guys? <laughs> the biggest guy in our game wears a black t-shirt and jeans all the time. <laughs> That's right. Proudly. That's right. Defiantly. That's right. And then you have you have us with the, with these numbers. Right. <laughs> now you you've gotten into the Shimada business, uh, and you're designing. You you have a label now, right? No, no. Band, what band so, of outsiders? That... No, that's not my label. I just wear I, I wear their stuff. Oh, yeah, I yeah. see. No, that'd be tremendous. Oh, if that, I see. They're a very successful label. That'd be tremendous if that was me. Why don't they cut you in for some of that stuff? <laughs> their stuff fits me really well because it's it's kind of smaller frame dudes. So I you know I can wear their stuff like pretty easily without having to get a ton of tailoring done so to they like give you some free, suit. They give you yeah. some free stuff? Whenever I do a tour, I right. have like, like a, I'll wear like a tour suit for that particular tour. Right. So every night I wear that particular suit. Right. So um, for the past two tours, I've kind of worked with them. And this last one, I really worked with them to make like a, a unique one that was just for this. That was very, mm -hmm. very special and like just a custom one that we did together and uh, it was really fun. Well, see, that to me is the most exciting thing in the world. It is. I, lo <laughs> I, lo I love suits. It's fun. So where do you get your stuff? Do you, what do you, what do you From do? all different places, yeah. Do you ever do like any custom stuff or do you, do you like I, get from it from my, from my wedding, yeah. I've, I had two suits made. One time I was working in London and I was there long enough mm -hmm. that I had a suit made. So I was like, Whoa, I have to. You gotta have. do that. Yeah. Have you ever been to, um, have you ever been to Tokyo? No, but I hear. Yeah, it's, that's I hear it's so crazy. It's, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you have like a good body size to where you probably won't have much trouble here. Like I'm so small, it's, 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 it's a little troublesome for me. Right. What, so what, what, what suit brands and stuff do you like? I like really traditional stuff. There's a, a, a place called Charles Terwitt that's a British company that, mm -hmm. that ships stuff here. Okay. I get a lot of stuff from them. And then there's Ben Silver, in, uh, which is a Charleston company mm -hmm. um, that makes sort of like Charleston South gentlemanly, Carolina. yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, they make sort of gentlemanly clothes. You have a, yeah, you have a gel gentlemanly yeah. uh, aspect to your style. Yeah, I'm preparing for, sure. for my old age. Wait, so what did you do for your wedding? Because it's tough with tuxes to like do something unique and kind of cool, but also not, you kind of have to stay somewhat close. We had a more informal wedding mm -hmm. and I had a suit made um, and I went to this guy called Mr. Lee on South Fairfax Avenue, it was mm -hmm. recommended to me and it turned out to be an accidental recommendation from somebody. He treats every request like you're asking him to pick you up at the airport. So it's like <laughs> saying, I wanna, I wanna do job. this. <laughs> exactly, exactly, but he's like one of these old, he's like, well, all right, that's gonna, that's gonna cost more money. I'm like, yes, I'm going to pay you. I'm not gonna beat the check on this. <laughs> I'm not like trying to drive up the cost and then somehow get the suit away from you. Like, I understand what it entails. But he, it was an amazing suit. So and what did like, a suit look like? What color? It's a... Uh... <laughs> I mean, this is super fascinating because you're a guy that cares a lot about suits and it's arguably the most important suit well, you're gonna wear. Yeah, that's how it felt to me. And I had a, I just had it in my mind. It was a, I wanted a double-breasted navy blue suit mm, and I was gonna okay. wear it with a yellow bow tie. Uh -huh. And it looked exactly the way a I white wanted shirt? it to look. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was what great. What kind of, what, did you do like, was there a pattern or anything? Is it like solid blue? There's solid blue, uh, nice red <laughs> lining. Mm. It's, can anyone else be interested in this? <laughs> there's some people that like suits. I'm sure, yes. If you're not into suits, go ahead and fast forward. See if we care. Because guess what? The suit talk's staying in. Aziz Ansari, thank you so much for being here today. Of course. Thanks for having me. A pleasure to chat with you. Yes, indeed. Folks, that is it for Speakeasy this time around. Uh, please join us for the next episode where my guest will be a different person. Now I'm gonna talk to you, but I'm gonna maintain eye contact with the Should camera. Should they like roll like some like stock music and then we pretend like we're still having a conversation That's exactly and right. then people are like, well, what are they talking about now? Exactly. They're real chums. This is probably the most fascinating <laughs> stuff. We don't get to hear it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and check back every Monday to see who I interview next. And for more info about Speakeasy, visit MadeMan.com.